Hey, welcome back everybody. This is part two of our ongoing investigation into political correctness and freedom of speech based on the response to Professor Gad Sad's talk to the University of Ottawa. Let's get right into it, shall we? Uh, Foundation of Individual Rights and Education, it's, the acronym is FIRE, uh, directed by a good friend of mine, Greg Lukianov, did an analysis of disinvitations. Disinvitations are instances where a university invites a speaker, say for example for commencement address, and then typically students, sometimes faculty, sometimes staff, will set up some sort of effort to get that person disinvited for whatever reason. And so they've documented from 2000 to 2014, and this is an underestimate, uh, of 192 such cases. In, this is in the United States. The success rate is roughly between about a bit more than a third to almost a half. So these are people that you've invited, and then somebody complains, and then you don't invite them anymore. Of course, the speakers that are most likely to be disinvited are the ones that are perceived to be to the right of those you know, triggering the effort, right? So it's not as though you're equally likely to be disinvited irrespective of the political position that you hold. Uh, depending on your position, you're more or less likely to be disinvited. Now, of course, this is profoundly chilling because it basically says that universities are becoming echo chambers. So I went to their website, and while the section that details the various disinvitations was kind of difficult to assess, as I couldn't find information on how they get their data or compile it, I don't want to start nitpicking it when I essentially agree with you. I mean, yeah, okay, I totally get why people are all kinds of annoyed when awful speakers are brought to their schools, especially when they're paid loads of money to do it, or when it appears to add credibility to a position that... But I say you just have to let people come in and say their piece in the interest of a free exchange of ideas. I do wish the data that the, these fire people uh, were collecting went back a little further so we could document these trends over time better, but beggars can't be choosers. I did want to read from their website for a moment since the speech thing is only one thing they do. FIRE's newest speech code report, Spotlight on Speech Codes 2016, the state of free speech on our nation's ca campuses, reveals that 49.3% of the 440 colleges and universities analyzed maintain policies that seriously infringe upon the free speech rights of students. For the eighth consecutive year, however, this percentage has dropped, and this is the first time it's below 50%. In another encouraging development, six schools eliminated all, eliminated all of their restrictive speech codes in 2015, earning FIRE's highest green light rating. However, under pressure from the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, a number of universities have newly adopted unconstitutional speech codes under the guise of harassment policies. So this would seem to somewhat discredit your thesis, as the report says the situation on colleges has been steadily improving over time, even by their standards. And they have tough standards. And also seems to suggest it's not the students who have been problematic here, but the Department of Education's concern for civil rights and harassment. This brings up a really essential facet of this overall debate. There are opposing ideas and values here that need to be weighed and discussed openly. The us versus them mentality is so unhelpful to what is, let's face it, an ongoing negotiation that could lead to a better collegiate environment for everyone if we would only stop throwing insults and accusations at each other long enough to have the conversation. Let's go on. This is from Canada, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. They come out every year with a scorecard of all Canadian universities in terms of how well they uphold and adhere to uh, freedoms. And so they look at four specific metrics, the stated official university policies, the actual practices of the university, student union policies, and then student union practices. So each university, in this case in Canada, we've got 55 of them that were rated. So there are 55 universities times four scores. 
they could give you either an A, which is your, it's a very free place, all the way to an F. So there are 220 scores. There were eight A's given out of 220 scores in Canada. There were 41 F's. So there are roughly five times as many fully failing universities in terms of their ability to foster environments of freedom as there were uh, at the other end of the continuum. Uh, for those of you that want to know how your school fares, uh, University of Allah, with all due respect, <laughs> scores an F, an F, an F, and a D. And just so that you don't think I'm bashing you guys, I put up my school as a counterpoint. We scored slightly better with a C, F, and a D, and an F. Uh, we both don't have much to be proud of. So here we start to have real issues. So this Justice Center is really problematic when you actually look into it. For instance, one of those Fs, the one for Dalhousie, was given out for their support of groups looking into having the college divest itself from fossil fuels. So I really don't know what that has to do with freedom of speech at all. In fact, out of all 13 Fs given out, only three were actually for acts of censorship of any kind. Most of the rest were just because they wouldn't absolutely promise never to censor anyone ever, in spite of the fact that the colleges were like, hey, we can't make that promise by law. In Canada, the constitutional free speech protections are not quite like they are in the U.S. And every province in Canada has its own hate speech laws, but it's like this JCCF group refuses to take that into account. If you want to change the situation, you have to change the law and not punish the colleges for obeying it. And some colleges won't interact with this group at all at this point because they say they're more interested in scoring political points than being accurate. And certainly they are funded by some right-wing interests and in particular seem most interested in evangelical Christian groups, which there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it does bring their objectivity into question. And even if we take that out of the picture altogether and assume that their report is totally fair, you're still left with three, count them, three actual incidents of censorship across the whole of Canada for a year. Three incidents does not equal an epidemic. Links below, back to it. Examples of what I'll, as I said, what I'll be doing throughout this talk is many of you don't know the, the type of landscape we're living in in academia. And so by offering you some very vivid examples, hopefully it will contextualize for you how the winds are blowing. So examples of language police, uh, these need not be strictly restricted, of course, to academia and academic settings, but you know, you shouldn't say secretary, you should say administrative assistant, uh, you shouldn't say janitor, it's a custodial engineer, and we could keep going down, you shouldn't say women, because women has men as part of it, it should be women, with a M-Y-N. Uh, you shouldn't say a terrorist act. It's a man-made disaster. You shouldn't say a fat or obese person. It turns out that I am differently weighted. <laughs> so when my, when my physician looked at me and said, hey, God, you need to lose some weight, I said, oh, oh that's fattest. <laughs> I'm differently weighted. You have no right to levy that accusation at me. Uh, then you've got, instead of older students, you know, students who are older because their age is older, that's ageist. They are non-traditional students. You don't say Merry Christmas in departments. You say Happy Holidays because it's offensive to trigger people with the word Christmas. Okay. So some of these things have been in practice since the 80s or 90s. I don't think I've heard stewardess for the past 10 years. But hey, language changes as cultures develop. Some of these words will catch on and some of them won't. Some already did catch on like 20 years ago. And some may be stupid by my assessment, but there are other people who might think differently about them. The issue I have here is the language police thing. 
there are places in the world right now where language really is policed by actual and not metaphorical police. And that should not be confused with people saying, oh, maybe calling someone an Oriental instead of Asian person is not the nicest, smartest thing ever. How else do we institute a thought police in universities or political correctness? Well, we do so by having those who are entrusted with teaching the students, hopefully all holding roughly the same uh, political viewpoints. So there's a study that was done by Cardiff and Klein, great study, I highly recommend you check it out, where they looked at the uh, political registration, of, this is in the United States, of professors across 11 schools that varied very much. Some schools are private schools. We don't have this distinction in Canada, but in the US you've got public schools, you've got private schools, you have religious schools and you know, secular schools, big schools, small schools. So they tried to cover the full spectrum and they looked at the ratio of Democrats versus Republicans in, uh, within the academic, within the faculty. The ratio across all 11 schools was five to one Democrats. Now that itself is quite problematic. Problematic not in the sense of you're taking a position, oh, but Republicans are better. Problematic in that you're shutting out political diversity. There are some issues that are not black and white. There are some issues that can be tackled in a broad range of ways depending on your starting point from a political perspective. But before I get into that, as you may or may not uh, know, the more you go into some of the social justice warrior type fields, the more that ratio gets more pronounced. So in engineering, you're likely to have a more even ratio across Democrats and Republicans. Whereas in sociology, we have our sociologist over here, 44 to one ratio. That's not a typo, that's an actual number. There's a 44 to 1 ratio of Democrats to Republicans. If all of you are one day going to be parents of children who are studying in the United States, and if you are intellectually honest, you should be upset about that. It doesn't matter whether you, you believe in the positions held by the Democratic Party or those of the Republican Party. You want people to be exposed to diversity of opinions. My man. <laughs> Thomas Sowell said, the next time some academics tell you how important diversity is, ask how many Republicans there are in their sociology department. In other words, we're very, very good at promoting endless forms of diversity. Racial diversity, ethnic diversity, religious diversity, sexual orientation diversity, and so on. But the most important diversity of all that should be at a university, which is intellectual diversity, no, that one we simply won't tolerate. We should all think in exactly the same way. And as I said, this is profoundly bad because not all issues uh, have a vertical scientific answer. Some of, some of the people wrote to me when, when I've talked about this and said, well, what do you mean, how could you not want people to be Democrats? Obviously the Democrats are all smart, and the Republicans are all you know, toothless, redneck hicks. And so clearly it must be that you'd want your professors to be part of the Democratic Party. Well, of course, that's outlandish. There are things where uh, that's true. For example, when it comes to evolution deniers, uh, they're much more likely to be within the Republican Party. So think about a typical Southern politician who's part of the Republican Party. He's, he, he or she is more likely to be an evolution denier in that case. I'm against that position. But some things are not clear black and white. What your position is on affirmative action or the death penalty or fiscal policy or gun control and so on uh, might be different depending on your starting point and you should be exposed to the different possible uh, perspectives. Hooray! We have found a legit issue backed up with legit data, yay! I was starting to worry, but here we are, back on track. Okay, so this is something that needs more research and more current research, and especially considering all the colleges looked at were in California, where there are more liberals than conservatives anyway, 
But I don't see any reason to think that there still won't be a disparity, and I agree with you. That's not good for a number of reasons. Now, you certainly jump the gun when you say they aren't there because they're not tolerated. That might be the case, but it might not, and you have to determine that with research rather than just assuming it. But hey, let's focus on the positive and take our momentum into the next session, section. Now this one is, is, I'm giving you a sample here of a much longer document. This is a group of student activists at Dartmouth College. I was a visiting professor uh, in 2002 at Dartmouth College. Great school, but certainly there are some rather uh, aggressive student activists. So they had this thing called the Freedom Budget where they occupied, I can't remember the exact details, maybe it was the president's office, and they uh, demanded that each of these, uh, well, demands be met. Now, I don't have all of them here, but I chose a few that are quite extraordinary. And again, bear with me as I read them. And again, think about what, how chilling it would be if such demands were met. So number one, you must establish Japanese language affinity housing, Korean language affinity housing, and Hindi Urdu language affinity housing. Why stop at these three? There are 10,000 different cultures. Let's set up a Lebanese-Armenian affinity housing. What about Lebanese-Jewish affinity housing? What about Turkish-Armenian affinity housing? What about Christian-Palestinian affinity housing? Right? So that's what identity politics is, right? The individual is lost. My identity matters first as part of a group. The next one is quite a good one. Ensure that 47% of postdoctoral students are people of color. I don't know how they got 47, but apparently there's something quite magical about 47. <laughs> and people of color, I'm from Lebanon. So am I okay? I'm not Caucasian. <laughs> what I speak about when I talk about evolutionary psychology, will it be more veridical or less as a function of whether I were Caucasian or a person of color as I am, brown and fat? It's offensive. Create a professor of color series. Bring a professor of color once a month in order to expose the Dartmouth community to a wide range of ideas. So if you want to study number theory in the mathematics department, you want to study the distribution of primes, you should bring in a person of color to teach that because maybe he or she has a different perspective about the distribution of prime numbers. Or might that reality be invariant of the person's skin color? I don't think Martin Luther King would be very happy with this particular set of demands. All right, I had to stop you there. Do you really think that Martin Luther King would be upset about a monthly lecture series by people of color? Really? Nice straw man there with the math bit. I think you know that's not what they were requesting, by the way. Now, I'm just going to briefly address the frequently heard I have a dream speech whereby people say they take that speech and say he just wanted a colorblind society that's it ignoring everything else he ever said or did or went to jail for or died for for instance there's this quote Many whites who concede that Negroes should have access to public facilities and the untrammeled right to vote cannot understand that we do not intend to remain in the basement of the economic structure. This incomprehension is a heavy burden in our efforts to win white allies for the long struggle. Or when he put it another way, I worked to get these people the right to eat hamburgers and now I've got to do something to help them get the money to buy them. So you see, he was not just interested in some sort of technical, legal equality. He wanted actual equality, including economic and social parity. So, you know, obviously we should just dispense with him because he was clearly a regressive leftist SJW and racist as well, the bastard. Ugh. Departments that do not have women or people of color will be considered in crisis and must take urgent and immediate action to right the injustice. Hey, math department, I don't see any women, pe people of color. It's crisis, time to intervene. Ask staff, faculty to use students and employees preferred 
gender pronouns. I gave a talk at Wellesley College a few years ago where a student came up to me after the lecture and she thought that it was perfectly reasonable that at the start of each course, professors, suppose I have like in this room, I don't know, 100, 120 people, uh, before I start the course, I should individually pull each person to find out what their preferred gender identity is before we go on with the course. To which I asked her if she thought that that was truly an optimal way by which we should organize society. And she thought, yes, because in case there is somebody whom you might address incorrectly, uh, you'd be sparing them their feelings by making sure you do this to everybody. All right. When people tell me about conversations they had with some random person a long time ago, I'm not bothered by that, but I don't consider it evidence. How do I know that you are remembering that conversation correctly, that you understood it correctly at the time? How do I know if that woman were right here standing next to us? She might have a completely different memory of the situation. So I don't count it against anybody, but, you know, I consider it a rhetorical flourish and that's it. All male, female check boxes, <laughs> check boxes should be replaced with write-in boxes to make forms, surveys, and applications more inclusive. Now, frankly, I don't know what some of these terms mean, but anyways, trans, asterisk, two-spirit, a gender, gender non-conforming, and gender queer, queer folks. This should be a campus-wide policy. So this whole idea that humans are a sexually dimorphic species, uh, you know, male, female, that whole biology stuff is a bunch of BS. We need to be putting all this trans star stuff. Enact curricular changes that require all students to interrogate issues of social justice, marginalization, and ex exploitation in depth. Each student should have to take classes that will challenge their understanding of institutionalized injustice around issues of race, class, gender, sexuality. This learning objective could be embedded in all first-year seminars. It doesn't matter what you're attending university f for. You will have to go to this re-education camp. We will tell you what you have to think. I don't care that you're here to study engineering or biology or neuroscience. You must take this re-education camp to learn how to hold the proper positions. And of course, professors are not free of the Gulag number 13 education camp. All professors <laughs> will be required to be trained in not only cultural competency, but also the importance of social justice in their day-to-day -day work. So between running studies, looking at how hormones affect, uh, say, women's behaviors when they're shopping, uh, I will have to take a break and attend a seminar to learn about social justice. Um, you do realize that these students were exercising their right to peaceful assembly and freedom of speech. Yeah? I mean, I thought that's the sort of thing you were in favor of. Even if we assume that every one of their points was absurd, and that's not the case, but even if it were, they were adding to the free exchange of ideas. I want to point out that these students are specifically saying they are looking to challenge their fellow students and teachers in this university setting. So, I mean, they have the same goal that you say that you have. So that seems to me to be a bit hypocritical, if anything. Why do only conservative people get to challenge other people's preconceived ideas and notions. And maybe racism is a distant memory in Canada, but in, in the good old US of A, it's still around. And that's just a fact. Not for nothing, they didn't get their way. Though the president said he would send out surveys to the student body at large about what they thought, um, as this group was only 35 students. But if it's me, I'm all in favor of bringing these ideas into the public domain so they can be debated. So, you know, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty liberal. So, for instance, if you ask me where, whether I would be more likely to agree with the Tea Party or Occupy Wall Street, obviously I'm for the latter. But I think both groups should be able to protest and, you know, seek redress from their government and all that other good stuff. And I'm just happy that that's the kind of country we live in. Um, also, I have no issue with trans or non-binary people, and I don't find the idea of adding a couple of boxes to forms to be chilling. Just saying. 
Here are some other recent examples that are quite breathtaking. Uh, on cultural appropriation and safe spaces, the Yale, how many people are aware of the Yale Halloween incident? Okay, quite a few of you. For those of you who don't know about it, let me briefly uh, summarize it for you. Uh, Nicholas Christakis is a very accomplished scientist. He's both a sociologist who studies uh, sociometrics, uh, how things move in, in groups, uh, and he's also a physician. And Erica Christakis, I think she was a developmental psychologist. She had some sort of teaching position. And um, as is true of many universities in North America, the administration puts out a flyer asking people to not wear any costumes that might be <laughs> cultural appropriation of somebody. So, you know, don't wear a cowboy because that's whatever. Don't wear a native Indian. Uh, don't wear uh, an Arab suit. Don't wear, don't wear Pocahontas. Don't wear, pretty much there is no suit that you could wear. Uh, and so Erica Christakis wrote a unbelievably tame, gentle, carefully worded, tepid letter stating, you know, maybe it's not right for universities to be imposing or interfering. These are adults. Yale students are adults, ultimately. They're at Yale. Uh, maybe it's not really within the purview of the university to be doing this. Some social justice activists got very, very upset. And her husband, who's also the master uh, of one of the uh, colleges, uh, came to her defense. Now, I'm going to show you trigger warning, trigger warning. There might be some uh, words of profanity. So if you're going to be triggered, please cover your ears. All right. In the interest of time, I'm just going to skip the Yale video. It's widely available online and just vouch for the fact that the young lady in question is yelling at her professor and saying swear words and cussing and generally losing her temper. You get the general idea. So she's in his face. She's hostile. She's swearing at him. He's in incredibly restrained and unbelievably polite. Uh, she argued that Yale is not about creating intellectual environments. It's about creating safe spaces. Okay? A home. A home. Exactly. All right. So again, this young woman from the Yale video that we've all seen, she clearly lost her temper. She clearly said some inappropriate words, and she was inappropriate. I'm going to be honest and just uh, share with you that there were times in my early 20s when I was a little bit rough around the edges myself. Sometimes we don't behave in the most exemplary way we could. So now we have my third alternate hypothesis, the maybe they should call it antisocial media theory. So this hypothesis states that the fact that so many more things get recorded and passed around the interwebs nowadays, that it has led to a distorted view of the landscape. Taking the Yale situation for an instant, most likely this is not the first time a student let her passions get ahead of her sense of decorum. But now anyone with an iPhone can get the footage and post it everywhere, and it goes viral. People see it over and over again. And Professor Sad, you know better than I do, I'm sure, about how repetition affects our quirky little human brains. Add that to the tendency of various forms of social media, especially the anonymous kinds, to bring out less than the best in some people. And the whole thing degenerates into Twitter flame wars, which attract onlookers like moths to flame. Then because... Of all this, a narrative or a common wisdom develops around isolated incidents, and we all know how reliable common wisdom is, right? I mean, I don't know why we bother with the scientific method at all when the world is so full of obviously correct opinions that everybody just knows. But the point is that we get this truthiness there, um, that there are increasing episodes of bad behavior when what we actually have is increasing visual records of bad behavior and some overblown media attention that when you drill down, you find out there's no there there. Okay, and just as a note, of course, the various um, 
hypotheses I'm throwing out are just alternative, possible, conjectural. You know, I'm not trying to say that I know and that I have the right idea. I'm just saying there are different ways of sort of looking at some of this information. There are other ideas about what might be going on, and those have to, they can't just be ignored. All right, again, uh, as we did the last time, we are going to discuss our status briefly. We're about halfway through the talk, and we're going to talk about whether or not the things that we are presented with support Professor Sad's thesis, if they describe how political correctness is causing this limitation on freedom of speech and expression. So the first thing we have here is the FIRE website. This one is, I guess, about 50-50. Clearly, there have been some speakers who have been disinvited. This has happened on the right and on the left, but it does seem to be happening a little more often on the left based on what I could see, though the evidence available is limited. On the other hand, the same website describes the state of free speech on campus to be improving. So a sort of thing there where his thesis is partly supported and partly brought into question. The next piece of evidence we are given is the grades that are given out by the justice group there in Canada. And this particular piece of evidence, it just doesn't quite meet the threshold due to the politically biased nature of the source. So it does not meet the criteria that we would want it to meet. Next, we have language police, and this one is if there was better evidence of where he got these various language policey things from. It appears as if he just wrote down a list of various different things that he's heard of, both in the academic and in the professional worlds, that are just changes in language, some of which are politically correct, and some I th I'm not sure they're just uh, changes in the actual the workplace language and jargon themselves. Either way, Professor Sad fails to provide any evidence that these particular bits of language are being enforced, that people are being punished or not following along, or that any other such things are, are going on. So we cannot assume that because there are proposed language changes that automatically equates to a, a lack of freedom of speech. We would need a little more than we have here. Again, Professor is a scientist, not a pundit, so the expectations for evidence are perhaps a little higher than that you would be willing to look for if you were just watching an opinion show. But on the other hand, evidence is kind of what you should be looking for whenever you're evaluating a claim with proper skepticism. Finally, we have the liberal bias of professors. This does support his thesis. It clearly shows that there is a bias, and while he does not exactly specify how that causes freedom of expression to be limited, I think we can clearly imagine ways that that could happen for ourselves. And it would be uncharitable at best uh, not to give him this one. So with that, we will soon be going into part three. Thank you. I hope you stick with me. I know it's a lot. It is important, and I really think that our evaluation of these issues, which have become such political hot-button topics, is serving a worthwhile purpose and is worth our time. Thank you.